you still don't have that. Oh, so I'm not supposed to don't now now anything. that you've set the computer up, don't touch anything. <laughs> Joe, what's up, Joe? How you doing, man? Thanks for having me on. Dude, absolutely. Um, so you know, I know your story a little bit. I, I have a, a, a cool bio uh which which you wrote, you know, but the our connection is our mutual friend, Matt Smith, star major type. Um, um how do you how do you know Matt? So that was the 18 Delta on my first ODA, man. So Matt took me under his wing when I first got the group and got me through three combat deployments. So Matt's like probably one of the smartest guys I've ever served with by far. Yeah. So Joe Kent, you uh, 20 years in special operations, working for the military in a variety of capacities. Um, kind of grew up in Northwest America, Portland, Oregon area. And um, now having served your country for an extensive time, um, your wife also an, an amazing contributor to the effort of the global war on terror and, you know, a hero herself. Um, you had a transition to civilian life. Um, so you're going to be run, running for office, right? Where, you, where are you running for office? Running for uh, Congress in Washington's third congressional district. So will you walk me through, um, one, your kind of career in the military, and then I think what I really want to know about is, you know, not, not just the transition after your, your wife's passing, which I'm so sorry, um, but what that was like, because, you know, I hear veterans talk about, you know, how tough transition is, and I'm like, bitch, please, you know, like, look. <laughs> Well, let, let, let's look at some real examples of hard transitions. And I don't think you can find a story that is, that's more inspirational, more incredible, more um, awe-inspiring than you and your family. Um, so let's start with uh, your, your military career. What did you do? How did you start? Why did you go and, and end up being a badass Green Beret? Yeah, man. So I, I, it's pretty much all I ever wanted to do, you know, like when you're growing up and you're a little kid and you actually have to come up with like a real idea of what you want to be when you grow up. I was like, I want to be a commando of some sort, you know, and this is before there was like the internet. So I couldn't do a ton of research. There wasn't dudes explaining, you know, how to go be a Green Beret or whatever. So I read books, read a bunch about Vietnam, um, really thought the mission of the Green Berets was pretty much the coolest thing ever. But at the time, yeah. there was no clear path to go right into special forces. So when I was a, I think, sophomore in high school, the Black Hawk Down incident happened. And so I saw like, you know, CNN kind of covered the aftermath of that. And I was, I was, you know, really inspired and kind of, uh, I guess, awestruck that there was guys over fighting in hard, brutal combat while we had peace back home in America. And so I was like, wow, that's, that's pretty amazing. So I went and talked to the recruiters and they were like, you can actually go right to Ranger Regiment uh, if you enlist as an infantry guy. And so that's what I did right when I graduated high school. I got a ranger indoctrination program um, contract and then went to Fort Benning and kind of got to live the dream, went to ranger indoctrination, served in a ranger regiment for three years, which is like hands down the best place to start out a military career because they they beat it in India, you know, that your job is to be physically fit and to be aggressive and to know, know your job, know how to shoot, move, communicate. So went to uh, special forces selection uh, on September 11th. So we were like two days in when the towers fell. Yeah. No way. Yeah. What was yeah, that man? like? It was pretty wild because we'd just gotten out to Camp McCall and done like, I think our first time ruck or time run. And they had us all come in the classroom, you know, the cadre are all super stoic and they come up there and they're like, America's under attack. And I'm thinking like, okay, well, is this part of like the scenario or, or yeah. what's the deal? And then they, they brought in some uh, TVs and let us watch some of the news. And then they were like, Hey, if, if you have family in New York or DC, like we're going to open up the offices and the pay phones. Cause this is before guys had cell phones and stuff. Um, and you can, free game you can call whoever you want just to make sure you know that they're okay and they know that you're safe um and so they kind of put us back into training later on that evening and then but every day when we were doing like the star course and we got to the our, our final point they'd let us have newspapers and stuff because they were like hey guys whenever you leave here whether you get picked up or not you're gonna go to war like the whole country's changing so it was it was pretty wild my, my mind's blowing you know i was uh on 9 11 a piece of shit uh, sitting in front of a computer, a dot com e commerce, debating what pants I was going to be wearing to the next party. Um, I was a UFC fighter uh, of uh, at the time. I was like a top ten dude, but I was like, a, I was a pathetic, useless waste of space. And here you are at Special Forces Selection on nine eleven. Like, again, I didn't know I could like you more, but now I like you more. So, 
Um, all right. So from 9-11, the country changed. You know, here we are 20 years removed and um, still at war, still in the country that we invaded. Um, obviously, we're still in Iraq. Um, you know, all of the terrorist training camps all over the world. Um, from North Africa, I mean, hell, all the way into Central Africa, um, Eastern Europe, and North West Asia, um, all throughout um, the tropical regions and everywhere near the, the, our horizontal plane, we have uh, training camps. It's not getting better. Um, how did you and your wife meet? And what was it like having... Uh, so for those that don't know, Shannon Kent, um, senior warrant officer, is that, or se senior chief petty officer, naval, naval. Petty officer. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's confusing. Chief and chiefs. So yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. The, um, yeah. and Navy rank just still, you know, here we are 17 yeah. years, in, years in, I'm like, what is that equivalent to in like a real military? No, yeah. they don't. Um, what was that like? One, how did you meet? And then two, what? serving together in that capacity. So my wife was a military contractor and th th there was conflict and she, you know, she's just at Fort Bragg. And um, when we met and, you know, she was at Fort Hood when the shooting happened and I was, I was wow. working um, and, but I can't even fathom what it would be like to have my, my spouse in, uh, it was, she's a cryptologist, right? Yep. So one, how did you meet and then how, what was it like having two members serving in the special operations community? Well, it was definitely, definitely high stress. We met at a uh, special operations unit. So I did about 10 years in fifth group. Um, and then after we pulled out of Iraq the first time in 2011, 2012 timeframe, I went to selection for a, uh, a special unit that does, you know, intelligence and special operations. So Shannon was the part of the intelligence uh, component of that. And so we actually were in some training together um met hit it off about a year later got uh, got married um and we pretty much knew that we wanted to start a family like right away so we started a family the um her being able to work at the nsa and still support the mission um kind of in that capacity really helped because while she was pregnant um and had when, we had when our children were really young she kind of work up at nsa at fort meade and kind of stay in the fight contributing um but she was no stranger to combat. When I met her, she had uh, four combat deployments already with Naval Special Warfare. So she she has a pretty inspirational story herself as well. I mean, she's a, she's from New York originally. Both her parents are first responders to the Twin Towers. Um, excuse me, her uncle and her father were first responders to the Twin Towers. Um, so after that, her and her younger brother, who's still in the Marines, went and found recruiters and said, put me in, coach. Um, and Shannon knew she had a knack for languages. She's just one of those people. So at the time she spoke French and Spanish and she told the recruiters, like, I can learn Arabic, like who will give me the opportunity to, to teach me Arabic and the Navy were the first ones that were like, okay, sign here. And so that's how she ended up in the Navy. And then for, after that, she learned Arabic and DLI and then started going on uh, volunteering for deployments. And this is kind of like the surge era um, when there was a lot of a big need to get intelligence operators close to actual special operators so that they could give actionable intelligence to them. And Shannon was kind of on the forefront of that. So she, actually was ahead of a lot of the, the formalization of putting women in soft. So that kind of put her as a, uh, a strong candidate to go further in special operations, which is where we met. So honestly, man, as weird as it sounds, by the time we, we met and had kids, we were both so far into our careers that it actually, it made it a little bit easier because we both knew what the other one was doing. There was no, you know, one person feels left out, no secret, to, no secret stuff. Um, so that, that helped, but it was, it was difficult trying to balance deployments, especially the final one that she, she went on. So you, you had um, almost a dozen combat deployments. And um, it's funny when people ask pe people like us, you know, how have you deployed? And you're like, yeah, I've, I've deployed. Like how, how many times you deploy? You're like, like, can, can you be more specific as to what you mean by deployed? You know, like, are people yeah. shooting at me? Am I training people that are going to go be shooting at people? Right. Am I, um, and my direct support to like the, 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 the list. So even though, first of all, 11 combat deployments, thank you so much. Um, but that doesn't even get close to reflecting, you know, what 20 years in this, uh, capacity that, that you and Shannon worked in and what that looks like, you know, that's, um, Mr. and Mrs. Smith are, are, are a couple of cowards in comparison, in, in my opinion, you know, like Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt can like, go do whatever they did in that movie and you guys can be actual real heroes. 
um, so Shannon passes uh, in Syria and she's with um, a special operations unit, um, some Green Berets at the time that were working in different capacities. What were you doing? And then, cause I mean, that, that was the catalyst of transition for you. It was, yeah. So I, I never planned on really formally transitioning. So when I hit the 20 year mark in the military, I went ahead and retired on a Friday. And then on a Monday, I swore into the CIA. So I had planned on making that my second career. Um, and so I was actually overseas on a, um, a shorter deployment um, for them when I found out she was killed. So I, I kind of found out ahead of the formal notification process. Um, so it was after I found out she was killed, I was overseas and I had to get myself home. Um, I kind of had a moment of clarity where I was like, well, today could have been a pretty bad day for or even worse day. I, I, I could have gotten killed too because I was outside doing things similar to what Shannon was doing when she was killed. So there was a lot of luck involved that my kids didn't become orphans that day. So I kind of realized, hey, I need to um, step away from getting shot at for a living, essentially, um, and figure out what life looks like putting my kids first and focusing more on home, which is, I mean, to be honest, it, it just wasn't anything I had considered before. I mean, Shannon and I had, had planned on letting her finish out her career and then her coming over uh, to the agency and, and sort of living that life kind of overseas. Um, that was our, that was our plan. So it, it was definitely a rough non-planned uh, transition to be sure. Yeah. Um, amazing. Uh, again, it's just like, I'm so sorry. Like, I, I wouldn't wish this on, on my worst enemy and and uh, let alone a friend. Um, and uh, so you, you're leaving, working for the government. Uh, you have two children that you are now the bread bringer and uh, father and sole parent of. Um, that in itself is a lot of work. It is, so yeah. in transition of what's next, why don't you just kick your feet up and... Um, be done. What, what, what is making you, cause what you're about, you're about to go back into the fray, like into, an, sure. into a fray that, um, when my wife, she asked of, of all the crazy things and dumb things that, that we do, she said, the one thing I'm going to ask is that you never go into politics. Um, that's fair. yeah, it's yeah. fair. That's a, it's a fair, that's a that's fair, fair. Qu yeah. request. And you are about to step into the, you are, you have stepped into the fray of the most unforgiving, selfish evil group of humans in america um you know I, I look at you know i'm a hunter uh and i pretty much just exist in a world with predators and mm -hmm. and and everywhere i look and everywhere that i go they never lead, let the dumbest or the weakest lead them but right now we're, we're we're in a period of time where we have the dumbest and the weakest leading us and then we have somebody like you that's stepping up to say I'm going to, I'm going to step into the fray. Why? Like what, what is going on, Joe? Yeah. I mean, it, it, I had intended to just sort of step aside and be able to kind of, I mean, relax for lack of a better term and, and put my children first. However, coming back home and I'm, I'm from the Pacific Northwest. And so the, the riots that went on in Portland and my hometown and pretty much throughout the entire Pacific Northwest really brought everything to light to me in the horrible condition that our country's in and then seeing within the last year the way that the media big tech members of our own government have just totally gone along with this narrative of you know labeling certain people as terrorists and other people not as terrorists one group gets away with being able to destroy cities for you know seven months the other group doesn't I think there was widespread improprieties of the last election. So just seeing that the, the course that our country is on has me deeply concerned because someday my, my kids are five and three. I'm going to have to look them in the eyes and explain to them that this is the country that their mother gave her life for. And the, the state that we're in right now, the direction that we're heading, like I can't do that and, and sit back and be like, well, you know, uh, I had some other stuff going on. So I really couldn't. I saw all this happening, but I couldn't do anything about it. So I, I I think the best thing that I can do right now is to actually try to go to DC and, and fight. I think, you know, the, the skills that we picked up throughout our career and especially understanding how government works and uh, understanding unconventional warfare, really, because I think we're in an information war right now. Yeah. Um, being able to take those skills and try and turn this ship around and get our country back on the right track is, is the best thing that I can do for my children. Yeah. I mean, you, um, you just said something that resonates and echoes in my head. Um, and it's, a, it's the same thing that when somebody asks why I'm doing something, uh, whether it's 
you know, the schools that I'm starting or um, Sheepdog Response, you know, which is trying to empower Americans um, still serving in the military. Like I, I don't need to, but I still want to. And it's, it's what you just said. It's, I'm going to have to look somebody in the eyes and the things that we have done, it has to have been for a reason. I can't look at my country while it's burning, while it's in flames, while it's in chaos and anarchy and be like, I lost my best friends in the world for this. You know, people like you that lost their wife that are now you know, like a, a father to two children without a mother that is now going to be going on to serve their country in another capacity because there has to be a reason that we're doing it. So like, that's amazing. That's the right reason. Um, I really, when, when Matt and I were talking about, about you, that was the question I wanted to know is why, you know, what is the reason that Joe is doing this? And that is the most powerful reason somebody could ever say is because otherwise all the sacrifice that you have made, that your wife made the ultimate sacrifice, it's for not, you know, it's for, it's for no reason. That's right. I mean, it's, we, we I think we've just poured too much into this right now. And, and, like you said earlier, I mean, right now in our government, there's a lot of really predatory people and a lot of really weak people. And I don't see a lot of good people that are going in there as those, for lack of a better term, sheepdogs who understand how to be aggressive, who understand how information warfare works and who will actually have the, the gumption to say, hey, I'm, we're going to stop this right here. I'm going to call you out. Like you guys can't continue to do this. I just don't think we have that. We have a lot of really extremely, I think, weak and selfish people. And then I think we have some people that are acting in extremely bad faith and just taking us in a, in a horrible direction. So I just think it's time for, for good people at every level, however they can, to stand up and, and really fight for this country. So we're, we're, we're like skirting around um, integrity, values, principles, ethics. Yeah, th those are things that are, that, are, that are almost mutually exclusive with politics. Um, you know, I, I think if you look at across the spectrum of all uh, candidates in both parties, and uh, we unfortunately are a two-party system, um, I don't see character. I don't see principles. I don't see value. Yes, there's outliers. Yeah, there's a spectrum. Um, but, you know, if, if I were to take a swath of, of current politicians from California to New York to Florida to Texas, um, I love that you said predatory and predator predators. They're not great things. Um, you know, they, they prey on the weak and they always put themselves first. Um, not that Dan Crenshaw is perfect. Um, he's not, there's things that we disagree on. So one of the things that I valued about him is he stepped in, in with an understanding of what selfless service looked like. And um, yes, there's compromises that have to be made when you're talking to somebody on the opposite side of the aisle. But first and foremost, character, ethics, and principles are going to be forefront. So as a widower, is that what a, a, widower. a, a widower? So a widower, 20 years in special operations, working for the CIA, now a father of two, you're going to go into maybe the, the most dangerous phase of an incredible career already what what is your strategy like how how are you going to keep your ship upright because i see great people that go into politics with the best intentions and then a year later i'm like i don't even know this person right. yeah so my, my strategy is just to stay as ground as i possibly can i mean my, my kids obviously gonna come with me and be a priority in my life but then talking with as many people in the community as i possibly can so the way I've gone about my campaign so far and intend to continue to go about it is kind of taking the, the SF model. I mean, really trying to have my key people in every part of my district. I don't have an incredibly massive district as far as how many people are here, but it's geographically very, very diverse. So it covers a lot of mileage. So I can't be everywhere at once. So I have to have my force multipliers in places. So getting to know all the different people in the different counties who are subject matter experts in different local issues, or they're just a key pillar of the community, or they're just a regular guy. I'm trying to engage with them as much as I possibly can because I know when I get to DC, the absolute noise is just going to be incredible between you know being attacked by the left wing media or or just really special interest groups, you know, or just the business as usual. This is just how it's done, given my mentality that people have in DC. I want to stay true to those people, but then also at the same time, like I 
I have zero desire to be like a professional politician for very long. If this is something I do for a term or two, but I can make an actual dent and, and hold some people accountable and try to turn our, our country back around. I know I'm not the only guy doing it. And so I think it's going to take a group effort. So hey, if I go there and for whatever reason, um, I'm not a appealing enough person for the swamp and that somehow takes away a lot of money from me. Like I'm fine with that. Like I'm not a professional politician. So I intend to stay grounded here with the people in the district. What, what, where's your district? So when, when somebody's listening and be like, man, this, this guy's all right. Um, that that's weird. That's a change. Um, where, where, where are your constituents? So we are just north of Portland, Oregon. So we're right on the Washington side of the Columbia River. So Southwest Washington. So we go all the way out to the Pacific, to the West there. We're the only red district that touches the Pacific Ocean. And then we go for about another uh, 200 miles to the East into like the high desert. So Golden Dale area uh, in the Columbia River Valley Gorge. And then we go as far North up almost to Olympia. So what are the big population centers in that district? Uh, Vancouver, right across from Portland, is essentially like a suburb of Portland. That's probably the biggest uh, population center that we have. Um, what is um, like? What What are the core principles? Like, if somebody who's going to take a elevator pitch from Joe Kent, what are What are the What are the things that your your platform is going to be fighting for? So we're going to push back against pretty much everything the left is trying to do from the erosion and the intrusions on our uh, First Amendment rights and our Second Amendment rights. So pushing back on something like H.R. 1, which is trying to nationalize our elections. That's something I'm very, very against and want to push back on. And I also want to adjudicate the election of 2020. A lot of people say a lot of different things. There was fraud. There was no fraud. I think it's caused this massive riff in our nation and there actually needs to be a full adjudication of it. Um, and I think Congress is the, the only place that that can happen now since the courts have pretty much shirked their duties. So that's key. Preserving our second amendment rights is absolutely key. And then, hey, I, I think we are approaching a 9-11 style crisis right now with our debt, especially as the Chinese are threatening to not, no longer buy our debt um, and attack our status as the prime reserve currency holder. If the Chinese are able to do that and uh, the Chinese and other nations don't buy our debt anymore, our entire system could pretty much crumble. And they could that would be a, a very effective attack the Chinese could wage on us without even firing a shot. So we have to get our national debt back in order. And I think all that goes back to onshoring as many American jobs as we can, getting us back to being energy independent. That also gets us out of a lot of our entanglements in the Middle East. That takes away a lot of power from Russia with Putin. And it brings back jobs here into America. So I, I say I'm an America first Republican. America first for me isn't just a strategy or a one topic type of issue. It's everything. So putting our country first and bringing back working class jobs. So everything that's happened in the last year with the COVID lockdowns, it's really targeted the working in the middle class. The major corporations that are supporting the far left, they haven't missed a paycheck. Amazon and all these guys, they are doing very, very well. Um, it's the working class Americans that are just trying to earn a living and send their kids to school and go to church. They're the ones that have been drastically, drastically hurt. So I think that's absolutely key. We have to bring back manufacturing, onshore all of our industry, and get our working class strong again. So that's my; those are my key issues. Yeah. Um, so what do I got to do to to come out and and hang out and shoot with you? How, how does that work? Because we almost had a time in, when uh, Matt and I were heading to Portland for a course, but uh, we just miss each other's on calendar. Um, when you, when you hit the trail, are you just going to be impossible to nail down? I'll be around. So, I mean, I live not too far away from Portland and we got a bunch of ranges out kind of all over the place. So yeah, whenever you guys are in town, let's, uh, let's definitely shoot. Yeah. I'd love yeah, it. Fun. What are your boys' name? Uh, Colt and Josh. Colt and Josh, solid names. Um, they're doing good. Yeah, they're doing good. They're, they're thriving out here. We got a little, little place on five acres up in the mountains. So it's, it's a little, little boy heaven. So yeah, that's yeah, awesome. Nice. Joe, the, uh, God bless you. You're amazing. Thank you. Uh, they're going to come after you. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And they, they don't fight fair. Right. Um, nope. I know we, it's weird cause we don't fight fair either. Uh, but in like specific places, right. We, we have to maintain this moral high ground here and yeah. maintain a moral high ground while everyone is doing absolutely everything else 
Um, I wish you the best success and I, I'm, I'm going to support you in any way I can. Um, how, how do people, much. how do some people support you? How do they donate to your com- campaign? Um, how do they spread the word? What, wh- where do they find you to follow you? Yeah, that's the biggest thing right now is getting the word out and then raising funds. So Joe Kent for Congress.com, the FOR Congress.com is key. People can read about all my stances to the various issues on, on that website. And then there's links to all my social media on there. And there's also a donate tab. So right now I'm in a war for resources against uh, the radical far left and against a kind of do nothing Republican. So anything that people can give, that's really going to help us get back and put America first. So even if it's just $5, I really appreciate it. Okay. Um, Anything I can do? Oh man, this is this is perfect right here. Giving me the uh, the signal boost and kind of getting the word out with with your platform, man. I really appreciate it. You're a huge right, influencer well, in the community. Never forget that you have hairy handed knuckle draggers that are always prepared to do violence on behalf of our country and friends. So I think that's you, the best endorsement I can get. Yeah, you got us, and there's a lot of yeah. us. All right, man. Well, hey, stay safe, stay free, and uh, I'll 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 put all of your stuff. Um, down below and like in all the words here where people awesome. can like click on things. Sweet. Um, <laughs> they click the links. Yeah, yeah. And do those things. All <laughs> right, man. Stay safe.